Welcome to Sports Save My Life. My name is Clayton Freck, and I'm the CEO and founder of Angel City Sports. We know the power of sport to change and in some cases save lives. We hear these compelling stories every day, and we created this show to share them with the world. Enjoy the show, and remember to like, follow, share, and comment. So welcome to Sports Save My Life. Today, I am beyond excited to interview my friend, 36-year-old wheelchair basketball star, Matt Scott. Born and raised in Detroit, Michigan. Matt was born with spina bifida, grew up playing sports. We'll learn more about that when he got into adaptive sports. Attended the University of Wisconsin Whitewater, which has a renowned wheelchair basketball program. He played professionally overseas for 12 seasons, he thinks. Can barely count and get that high. Uh, but more important than that, I think, is that he's a five time Paralympian, uh, just competed in the Tokyo Games, uh, and he's got two golds and one bronze to show for that. He's come to the Angel City Games, presented by the Hartford, for many years. Actually, we think first year was 2016. So he's almost an OG because we started the games in 2015. He recently took a job at Visa and moved up to the Bay Area. And I think we're going to get more, but retired from professional ball. Uh, but, you know, above and beyond all the accomplishments and medals, you're going to hear Matt's story. He's an amazing human being. He's kind. He's generous. He's always ready to spend time with a kid or an adult or anybody that's looking for some love or encouragement. And listen, I saw a lot of Paralympians in Tokyo this year. Matt has the brightest smile in the Paralympic movement. I'm calling it right here. Matt, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I, you know what? I feel like um, I've, I've had a lot of intro. You know, you, you, named, you named a lot of those accolades. and I feel like I've been introduced a lot of places. This one's warm, man, and I appreciate you, brother. Thank you. Well, the fun part of, about these intros is I know most of you guys that I've been interviewed. So it's like I can add a little color, right? It's not just a resume. Uh, but that smile, man, you could power a city with. So keep it, keep it rolling. I appreciate it, man. I'm in a new city now, so I gotta gotta <laughs> try to try to power that with me. <laughs> uh, all right, so I like to start the show with your gut reaction to the title of the show. Sports save my life. What does that mean to you? My gut reaction to sports saving my life is um, I kind of laugh just because sports is my life. You know, it, it didn't save my life. It's it's sports be, has become my life. Um, mm. I, it's, it, I could just, I could just stop there. You know, sports is my life. That's, that's. So, far so if you didn't have sport, who would you be? What would you be doing with your life? What would I be doing with my life without sport? That is such a hard question to answer. Clay. <laughs> to be honest, like, I mean, honestly, every, every person that I know, every relationship that I've had, every, yeah. every experience, every amazing experience that I've ever had in my entire life has stemmed from my involvement in sport. Mm. Um, sports is such a powerful thing. Um, I, it would just be like saying like, what if you've never uh, eaten a meal or what if you've never taken a breath or what if you never, <laughs> it, 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 it would be just like that. Um, I, I don't know. I, I probably, I probably would be here. Well, you know, people say that about disability often. Uh, you know, they say, you know, if you like, would you want to not have your disability? And people often go, well, I wouldn't have all these friends. Like, I don't know what would life look like if I didn't, you know, and that's a cool way of sort of accepting your disability, accepting your life and that your life is full. Right. And you're not like wishing for something else. So, but that, your answer kind of reminds me of that. Uh, yeah. that there, there is a lot of parallel there. Cause yeah, you know, I get that question often just probably like many other people do is like, you know, what would you do? What would you do if you, you know, were walking around? No, nah, I don't want to walk around. Give me my wheelchair basketball. Give me my wheelchair. And, you know, and let me go dominate the sport. That's that's all I want to do. I want to walk. I don't want to run a marathon. I want to do what I'm doing. So uh, I don't know what I'd be doing if there was no sport, Clayton. I would. That, that sounds like a bad reality. <laughs> all right. My last sort of warm up question before we get going into childhood is uh, give me. Give me one sentence that describes who you are. Who is Matt Scott? Who is Matt Scott? Matt Scott is a is an energetic, energetic, fun-loving, charismatic, and genuine 
wheelchair basketball player that just loves to, um, you know, wheelchair basketball players going in that sentence, you know that, but um, just that, that just, that just loves to, um, it just loves to bring the best out of life. Um, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm an optimist at heart. Um, and I'm just always seeking um, the, the positive, uh, the po- the, just the positive things in life. You know, I'm all, I'm a positive person. And that's, uh, that's who Matt Scott is. That was good. That was good. You're right. You are very positive. So, all right. So I want to, I want you to start from the beginning. Uh, you know, give me, give me your origin story. Tell me about your, your childhood. Tell me about your, your parents, uh, family structure, how they handled, you know, learning and when they learned when you had spina bifida, kind of that whole, that whole story. So let's start from the beginning. So, I mean, having a, having a disability for me is just, you know, is, is very, uh, it comes very natural because I was born with my disability. It's called spina bifida. Um, I was born in, born in the eighties, uh, where, you know, they're still kind of figuring, figuring it out as far as, um, Oh, you know, well, give us your birth year. I'm, I'm born in the, I was born in 1985. I'm 36 years old. Yeah. Not that, right. I'm not that stone age yet. You're such I mean, a baby. I had a, I had a, I had a Walkman and a regular Nintendo and, I was here before the internet, so those types of things. You couldn't Google stuff. All right. Can you explain what spina bifida is for anyone that might be listening, doesn't understand uh, right. that? So spina bifida is the number one birth defect in the world. Um, basically, when I was born, uh, my spine have, had not been fully formed. I mean, just, you know, just to put it in, in layman's term, mm-hmm. um, there, was a, there was a small opening in, in my spinal column when I was born. And since there was a, that was exposed, um, it's almost like uh, a wire wires were, were exposed and they, they became frayed. Um, yep. so the, the, um, the messages don't get down to the messages from my spine don't get to my legs or, um, not, not as well as it would, uh, a person with a fully abled, uh, spinal cord. So that is, uh, that is a little bit about spina bifida. I also have a secondary disability, um, because both of my feet are amputated. Um, and that that basically came from being a very active uh, kid, like just not a care in the world kind of kid, um, getting after it, crawling around, um, you know, crawling around on the ground, making, you know, putting my putting my legs in, in, in harm's way more than uh, caring about uh, mostly caring about whether I was having fun, <laughs> you know, I was having so, fun. So did you injure your, the, the feet at some point and it was like unrepairable? Uh, no, I wouldn't say unrepairable. It, so it got to the point where um, they, there were open wounds on them and they became infected. Um, and those, those infections got down to the bone and that bone, you know, and that, that causes, um, that causes the need for, um, you know, removal. So uh, when I was a kid, I did not want that. To be honest, I had these like really small clubbed feet. They look, they look crazy. To be, to be honest, I try to picture myself sitting in a basketball chair with these clubbed feet. There's no way I would have been the basketball player that I am now. Because Come on. There's, no, there's, no way. there's no way. Well, first of all, I wouldn't have been as cool because, you know, okay. I do my, my one shoe, my one shoe backwards, one shoe forwards thing. That's that's my thing. I uh, wouldn't have been able to do that. But I don't think I would have been able to sit in it the way I do now, you know, because of this, these club feet. So it was almost like serendipitous that I got these feet amputated. So you feel like you move better in the chair. You fit better in the chair because you, you amputated your feet. Oh, hundred percent. hundred percent. I feel like it was the most serendipitous thing that could have happened. You know, now I'm more, you know, I'm more comfortable in my chair. And, uh, but yeah, the, the, the thing about the, the, the amputation is I didn't want it when I was a kid. I didn't want my feet removed. I, I cried. I, I told the doctor I didn't want it to happen. How, it how old were you? How old were you when you were going through that? So I was, so I got, actually, they were amputated at two different ages. So my first, my left foot was amputated when I was around <laughs> eight or nine. And then the next one was four years later. And we're skipping around, but it's okay. Cause this is fascinating. Cause I actually didn't know this about you. Right. So that is kind of a serious surgery i'm gonna say traumatic potentially traumatic surgery for a kid of that age uh talk to me about that the thing about it is i mean i feel like life is um i've had i've had i've had an interest in life i feel like the you know being able to take take crucial blows at at a young age is just Mm -hmm. something that i you know just became 
you know, accustomed to. Yeah. Um, my, my, my mother taught me to be incredibly uh, mentally strong. Um, I watched her go through a lot as a kid, um, which helped me, um, you know, also, you know, basically pride myself on becoming, you know, a mentally strong individual. Um, so when things when things got hard or things were, were tough for me, um, I just had this, you know, tough shit mentality. Like, let's, you know, that's next thing, next, next, next move, next play. Let's let's keep it moving. Whatever, whatever this was, I just needed to um, I needed to frame it. I needed to figure out a way around it or a way through it. And then I had to just keep it going. So even I mean, I can kind of see a 12 year old use doing that or a 12 year old in general. I have a 12 year old. I have a nine year old. So when you're eight and you're getting your foot amputated, <laughs> that you were really thinking that rationally at eight years old. To, to, to be honest, to be honest, you know, I, I cried my eyes out. Um, I was I was so I was so. Um, so eight was harder than 12. No, yeah, exactly. So the so the first one that came off, I, I was like, I was crying my eyes out. Please don't do it. By the okay. time that the second amputation happened, I was basically asking for it. Ah, yeah. I was like, yeah, OK, I know what's going on. Let's just get rid of this thing so I don't have to be sick anymore. The infection was making me sick. Yeah, um, I, I knew what, uh, you know, I drew a conclusion from what happened when I was eight. And I'm like, let's just get rid of this thing. Mm. Mm. So you're one of those rare people that gets to check the spinal cord injury box and the amputee box. Absolutely. <laughs> Dumb, like just just, you know, I'm trying to I'm trying to have as much uh, as much disability as I possibly can. Yeah, you know, I heard it. I heard it helps in your classification. Classification is <laughs> big in, in sports. <laughs> Man, that's so funny. Uh, okay, give me a give me talk to me a little bit about uh, the family structure that you arrived into, um, and mom or dad or mom and dad, however the family structure was, uh, and like how did they handle this? So my I was I was born and raised into a a childhood and a household with a mother and father and a and a you know an older sister. Um, you know, life life happens, you know, families happen, there's family, family trials, family struggles. Um, that ended up being a uh being a single mother household. Um when I, you know, and there was there was a there was a split between my mother and father. We had to kind of you know, go back and forth the households. Yeah. Uh, when did they know. split? How old were you when they split? Uh, I was, uh, it was around middle school, it was around middle school, okay. around 12, 12 or 13. You, you got um, through those, some of those early years with a family structure that was, you know, yeah, both absolutely. parents were there at least. Well, both parents were there. Um, you know, it was, it was interesting because, uh, you know, my, my mother's always been my rock as far as, um, you know, especially in when it came to being, uh, a, a little kid with a disability because mm -hmm. you know I would I would want to meet kids and I would want to I would want to go out and, and hang out with the, you know with the kids I would see them playing basketball and things like that and I was a little bit shy and I didn't necessarily want to go out and, and and throw myself out there um, and my mom always encouraged me to uh, she would not let me just you know just you know be in the house like she would just like go out there and play and you know if, there, if somebody picked on me or teased me or something she would send me right back out there and you know uh, I would I would either have to go back and either confront these kids or, or you know tease them back or like my mom just wasn't having it like I wasn't just going to be um you know this kid who was just kind of like getting picked on like I she she taught me like hey you're you know you're just like these other kids go out there and get in you know get into get into trouble just like they are yeah. Um, I remember um, I went, you know, my, my father, when they were, when my mom and father were still together, um, you know, one of the best things my dad did was give me a basketball and it was like, it's really kick-ass basketball. Um, and so I used to take that basketball and dribble around the neighborhood. Um, so I would quickly go from, Hey, there's that kid in the wheelchair to, Hey, there's that kid with the basketball. That was, um, I, that that was a that was a way that I I quickly was was identified and it was a way that I um you know I, I defined myself you know I mm. I was always I was always that kid with the basketball and you know and that still kind of resonates to to where I am at today. I, I love that story. It's like it's like it's the simplest thing of a basketball changes you know it changes little kids' perspective of of who that 
you know, the kid is down the street, uh, you know, like, Oh, he's a basketball player. You know, like that's, that's pretty cool. What was, it sounds like your mom was really on it. You know, uh, I know like, like a really on top of it, mom, what, what, what was her, her and your, your dad's parenting style? Were they strict? Were they chilled? It was the, did you have to kind of get yourself around? I mean, you know, were you, were you like latchkey kid? What was, what was going on with that last my my mom was 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 no nonsense. Like if I didn't want to if I didn't want to clean the clean the house or you know clean my room, like I wasn't going to be able to you know play Nintendo or go outside, which I really love to do. I was going to get punished just like any kid. I was going to get yelled at just like any other kid or spanked like a kid back in the eighties. You can't do that anymore. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, like my like my mom was was no nonsense, and her mentality has always been really great. Um, you know, she was you know she. Had, she had a kid that was born with a disability and people, you know, come up to a mother like that, like, oh, my God, I'm so sorry. You know, you, they, they, they treat a mother like that very differently. And my mom was just kind of like, like, no kid is walking out of the hospital. Like, I'm going to carry my baby out just like everybody else is going to carry their baby out in order, you know, raise them just like anybody else would raise their kid. My mom has always treated me as, as, you know, just like she would like my sister or any other, you know, anybody else treats their kid. And my mom just always had this very, uh, she understood, you know, she never babied me, um, which was huge. You know, she, you know, she treated me um, how I needed to be treated as a kid coming up uh, with a disability. I wasn't babied or, or dragged along, uh, you know, in a, in a sheltered kind of way. I want to, I'm going to do a show with your mom one of these days, man. This is like so good. So She's a star. where, where did she get that? Like, how did she know how to parent a kid with a disability? Cause that's, that's to me, I look at the community and you see the community just as much as I do. Right. We, we see a lot of parents that baby their kids that overprotect them. And so the kids don't learn any toughness or resilience and, you know, they whine about stuff. I mean, you know, sport helps pull the kids away a little bit from the parents, but there's only so much you can do if that's what's going on at home. So how did your mom know how to do that? Do you think? Well, I mean, she's just a special lady, to be honest. I, I don't actually know where she got that from, but the thing is, is that she just has this like innate ability to, to just treat everyone as an equal. Like she yeah. doesn't like, yeah. that's just the way she is. Like she doesn't like, she, she doesn't treat anybody differently, you know, yeah. whether you know, no matter who it is, like she, she just always has like this, you know, this equality on, on her mind. Um, but she, you know, she, 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 it was love, you know, to be honest, it was just love. Like she, she knew I had a, a spark in my eye when it came to sports or being active. So she encouraged that, you know, she wasn't afraid, you know, and maybe sometimes I did some things that, you know, scared her a little bit, you know, like going, you know, going down curves or going downstairs and things like that. But, you know, she would see it, I would do it, and then she would encourage it. Like, she was a very encouraging mother, just like every mother should encourage their kids to go out and do the things that they love. All right. Uh, yeah, well, I, yeah, I can't wait to meet her someday. She sounds she's, like she's, uh, she's a like star, me. man. My mom's a star. She is a star. Uh, all right, so give me, give me a, a, I don't know, give me kind of a, a crazy story about your childhood that encapsulates you know who you were as a kid crazy story mm, let's see like did you ever get in trouble uh did you you know whatever i mean i don't know so the so the thing about it is is like i i had a I had an older sister and she she got in all the trouble that that i needed to you know like she really I mean, she, well, she, like, she was the, she was the leader, you know, she was, um, like, she didn't, how can I say that? Like my, like my sister, she showed me all, all of the ways to, to grow up right. You know, like she was a, she was a very, very good sister as far as, um, as far as like, all right, obviously like she like, you know, bullied me like a, like a big sister would, but she showed me the, what was right and what was wrong. And she was a very, very good leader in that regard. Mm-hmm. Um, I was, yeah, I was kind of a boring kid. Like I didn't do too you didn't much. get in trouble. I, I mean, I, I, I would like fight with my, with my kids, with my friends. Like I we used to fight all the time. 
like wrestling matches would turn into you know you know fists all the time you know seriously you know, oh all the time yeah absolutely if you grew up, if you're a kid that grew up in Detroit you had to throw some hands that's just how it goes um you know so and so you're in a chair and you're fighting kids that aren't in chairs or were you uh, ambulatory oh no 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 definitely I was always in my chair always, in, always chair. in my chair yeah but the thing about it is um you know the kids that that I grew up with just a lot like my mother um they didn't they didn't you know, give me any, uh, get any, any slack. So if I was playing you know, football with them or playing basketball with them, um, they were, they were going to try to beat me. Um, I would, I would talk all kinds of trash on the basketball court. Um, you know, if, if we, like I said, if we were wrestling, like I would, you know, I'm trying to slam them. If we're playing football, I was going to tackle them. If we're playing basketball, I was trying to beat them. So it was, it was like one of those things, but yeah, you know, kids get in the little fights and things like that. And you know, I was, the, I was one of those kids. Got it. Mm-hmm. other than your disability i don't even know if you would consider your disability a challenge but what would say what would you say was sort of the biggest challenge that you face in your childhood definitely uh socioeconomic uh we don't we don't come from much we you know we just a you know i guess you know below below average you know income household that um you know just 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 try just try to make it you know um, as far as, uh, as far as wheelchair basketball was concerned, there was no way that, uh, I was going to be able to, um, to afford a, a basketball wheelchair. I used to play, I used to play basketball on my everyday check. Mm. Um, I, you know, that's, that's just the way I played. I would, um, I started on, you know, playing street ball with my, with my friends. And, um, when I first started playing wheelchair basketball, there was no way I was going to get a basketball wheelchair. Um, so um, that was, that was a big, uh, that was a big challenge. And, you know, one of those, you know, one of those challenges was immediately uplifted for me, um, because my first chair was donated to me a lot. Like, you know, you see some of those um, donations that happen at, at the Angel City Games, you know, some of those yeah. hard donations. Um, that's why, that's why being a part of the games, that's why being a part of the Angel City Games and being a, being a team Hartford athlete means so much to me because I know what it's like to. You were that kid. Yeah, I was that I was that kid to maybe have the um, have the opportunity and have the potential to maybe be a star, but just not have the resources to do that. So. So how when did you know wheelchair basketball was a thing and how did you find it? So basketball was just always a thing. Like I told you, you know, right. I, I get an early identity um, as a kid, didn't know anything really about wheelchair basketball. OK. Uh, you know, the, the Paralympics wasn't on NBC and, and there wasn't there wasn't any Matt Scott's running around making the sport look amazing. Right. So uh, there were some old guys. I mean, but they maybe they weren't that famous. That's true. It's true. And, you know, and, and social media wasn't a thing. You know, it's just like, yeah. yeah. Was, How did you get information? back? It was then? a lot harder to, to assess. You know, I'd go to a, a you know, a, a hospital visit or a doctor's appointment and they would try to sell me on it. Like, hey, wheelchair basketball is cool. And I'm like, yeah, whatever. You know, like, I, I don't want to hear that. That doesn't sound competitive at all. Um, but, you know, and the, the the picture that I had of it in my mind is way different than what it actually was. Mm. Because wheelchair basketball is one of those sports, to be honest, adaptive sports is something that you just have to see. You know, when somebody tells you like, hey, um, you know, there's this, there's this kid uh, with, you know, one arm, one leg, and, and you know, he's going to go to the basket behind his back and, and hit a, you know, Get a free hit a, a layup. You don't, you know, you don't. You can picture it, or you can try to picture it, but until you see it, it doesn't really resonate with you. So, seeing wheelchair basketball for the first time is what made me stick with it. That's when it became a thing. Mm-hmm. Um, I stepped onto a court. You know, there was some behind the back passes going down. There was some three point shots, and I'm like, yeah, I belong here. This well, is this- how, how old were you when that happened? Uh, I was about 13 or 14 when I first saw my first wheelchair basketball uh, practice. It was in, like seven, like seventh eighth grade. And where where was it? Was there a t- there was a team in Detroit, right? So uh, our team was called the Sterling Heights Challengers. Um, I don't know if you know I don't know if you know Mikey Peg, but he was at my first wheelchair basketball mm-hmm. practice, and uh, there was a there was a bunch of guys out there um, who. They were just awesome, man. There was, you know, there was, you know, a guy by the name of Jay Nelms, uh, Diddy Muha, Matt Bushy, and Mikey Pay. All these guys that I now know as like these great wheelchair basketball players. They were all there. Um, 
just as kids, just kind of having fun, you know, throwing the ball around. But seeing them play and seeing the fun and joy that they had for the game immediately um, resonated with me and, and made me want to jump right into it. And then how did you how did you get that first chair then? So it, it, that, that didn't happen immediately. So I, you know, I first started playing, um, like I said, I was, I was just in my day chair. Um, mm-hmm. I didn't, I, you know, didn't, didn't come to practice and just automatically have a, have a ball chair. I, I played in my day chair all the time. Um, that probably went on for about two, about a year and a half or two. Mm-hmm. Um, I would just show up to, you know, practices. I would go to these tournaments. Um, I had a, I had a chair, that you could kind of, you could take the wheels off and like adjust the camber to where it was a little bit like a sports chair, but not really. That's you cool. Yeah, not is it cool though? <laughs> <laughs> so, so you could kind of adjust the camera and it would be like, I'm definitely using air quotes here as like a sports chair. Um, so I, I tried that for a little while, but mm. you quickly plateau you quickly reach a point where you're not going to get very much further. But my, uh, it was, you can, you can see I had the attributes. I, well, first of all, I had a lot of, a lot of enthusiasm for the game. Um, I could, I could, I could play the game. My arms were super long. I was pretty fast. And so you could see my potential. Um, just like when you step on a court, you're like, Hey, that kid could be good. Um, I got on the court. I was invited to a to an adult team practice, and uh, a guy by the name of Willie Hernandez, um, who is the uh, the creator of Performax, um, he was at this practice. Oh he had wow! Traveled, he had traveled to Michigan. Um, to be honest, I don't know why he was in Michigan. Maybe to sell chairs. Maybe to just visit. I don't know. But he was there, and he was at this practice, um, and it was my time to. Uh, to be honest, I didn't, I didn't, wasn't out to prove anything to anyone. I was just trying to play basketball, but he immediately saw the potential in me and was like, Hey, um, why are you in that chair? <laughs> and I'm like, well, this is my, this is the only chair that I have. And he was like, well, do you want to, you know, do you have a ball chair? I'm like, no. He's like, do you want to try one? I'm like, yes, please. So he went to his, went to his van, grabbed the, grabbed the ball chair, gave it to me. I played in it, had an awesome run at it. Mm. And everybody was just, you know, <laughs> Their, their jaws were dropping. They're like, oh, my God, that was awesome. And I was just so grateful. Went, went to go give him the chair after it. Like, hey, man, thanks for, thanks for letting me have, like, use this chair for this practice. And he's like, what do you mean? That's all yours. Take it. Take it home. That was the, I mean, to this day, I think that might have been, like, one of the most, that might have been the greatest thing that's ever happened to me in wheelchair basketball. Um, you, know, I've, you know, I've won I've won countless championships. I've raised gold medals. I've, you know, done the, the I've, I've, I've reached the top of the mountain in wheelchair basketball. But getting that donation for Willie, um, that made that all happen. Wow. That's a great story. Uh, and, you know, you see this in the community, right? You see a level of kindness and generosity that honestly, I don't feel like exists in the rest of society. <laughs> right. So this is just like one more data point. Like this world that we're in, this adaptive sports world is pretty amazing. Uh and uh in what you're a you're a true testament to that. And right, where where does you you know you're not playing well enough to make the team at Whitewater in your day, you know, your day-to-day chair. So you really needed that chair. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it was it was a springboard for everything. I mean, equipment just sets us all apart. I mean, there's I mean, that's that's all adaptive sports. You know, you can you can have a guy in a, you know, a prosthetic leg and just walking around on his regular, you know, ambulatory prosthetic leg. But until he gets that like running blade that like sets him apart from every everybody else that that makes sure that he's um, being the best athlete that he can you know, you, you really get set back if you don't have that equipment, just like, you know, a racing chair, a wheelchair, basketball chair, a tennis chair, our equipment really sets us apart and allows us, it gives us that ability, um, that access to, to athleticism. Right. I'd like to take a quick break to show you how you can get involved as a volunteer with Angel City Sports. Are you interested in supporting Angel City Sports? We're seeking volunteers to help organize clinics and events, as well as support our athlete outreach efforts, marketing and media, and even fundraising and development. 
All skill sets and backgrounds are welcome in support of our mission to provide free adaptive sport opportunities for children, adults, and veterans with physical disabilities or visual impairments. For our younger athletes, we welcome you to join the Angel City Youth Leadership Council. Middle and high school age students are eligible to join the Youth Leadership Council, where you will learn about the disabled community by working side by side with our athletes and acquire important skills such as teamwork, leadership, philanthropy, and event management. To sign up for our volunteer your newsletter and stay up to date on all upcoming opportunities, visit angelcitysports.org. Let's stay in childhood just a little longer. Um, cause I, one thing that I really am interested in is, you know, kind of how, where, when, and why does self-confidence develop and kind of, you said earlier, you were a shy kid, which is sort of hard to imagine because you are not a shy adult. Uh, in any way, shape, or form. But, you know, how was your self-confidence, you know, going through whatever, grade school, middle school, high school, you know, were there periods where you were not doing well and kind of down, uh, you know, like, did your friends keep you up? Like, what was your self-confidence journey and, and how is it related to your disability? My self-confidence, oh, shoot, excuse me. My, self, uh, my self-confidence journey is interesting because uh, I don't think, I don't think of myself as a very, like, I wasn't a cool kid. I wasn't a very cool kid at all. How is that possible? I, I, I mean, I, I just, you know, I, I kind of, I had my friends, you know, I had my friends, the, the ones that were like into, um, into sports or video games or, or whatever the case. Um, and I had like a really, like the, the kids in the neighborhood, those, those are the ones that I, that I, I got along really well with. Cause you know, what, you, 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 you are, you are, your, you are your neighborhood, you know, when you, when you grow up, you know, the, those kids, um, they knew me really well. Um, they spent a lot of time with me because those are the kids that I like, I would, you know, go out and play with and spend time with. But like at school, I would just kind of stay to myself. I wasn't, you know, I was, you know, as a, as a middle schooler, I, I wasn't very, um, I wasn't that outgoing as far as, you know, mm socially i wasn't that outgoing socially in the neighborhood like i said that's that was that was a different story i was hanging out with all my friends and um you know we were we were we had a lot of fun you know like i said you know it was mostly sport related or video game related but like i had my my group of friends but like branching out in school wasn't really my thing and i think you know one one thing i actually had this conversation with someone the other day is so sports has always been my my confidence. Like it's always been my self confidence. It's always been my way of like showing people like, hey, I'm not just like some kid like sitting here like helpless kid in a wheelchair. Like I I do this. Like if you give me if you give me an opportunity to show my athleticism, I feel good about myself. In school, I was I was immediately taken away from um, from opportunities like that because I, I I couldn't have like a gym class. Mm. We didn't. Um, like everything athletic or, or, um, you know, physically, uh, physical education, those, those things were taken out of my curriculum. They would just give me like, Hey, go be a hall monitor or go do like an extra study hall. I think that really played into like me just kind of staying to myself. Cause like, and that you know, was entirely because of your disability, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That I, was... I, couldn't, I couldn't be in those, you know, the, the gym class curriculum. I couldn't be, on a sports team, you know, whereas like all the other kids in school had access to that. I, I mean, did. that's really, that's really terrible. I mean, it is, it is. Um, I also had, you know, I had a similar conversation is like, I wasn't looked at as, as an athlete in high school. Right. Um, whereas like, if you go through my yearbook right now and you find the best athlete or any athlete at all and not you find and figure out what their accolades or what they're doing right now i guarantee they don't amount to what i've accomplished right <laughs> i mean you proved them wrong over time but <laughs> that, i mean that and that wasn't the goal the, the goal wasn't to prove them wrong it's just it's just <laughs> interesting to see that you know that you're not really treated as you know as you are you know i i i saw myself as an athlete and they didn't see me as so that that played into my social. So you in, in the school setting, you shrank a, a bit from your true self, but in the neighborhood, you were the Matt Scott that I know. Yeah, I, I was I was myself. I was um, yeah. I, it, the, those kids, the kids that I live with, allowed me to be myself. They brought the best out of me. They didn't um, 
they didn't let me, they, they didn't give me any slack, man. They, they just did it. Like, you know, if I was having a bad day on the court, they were telling me about it. If I was, you know, they, they, those kids, those kids held me accountable. It was great. But in, yeah, in school, as you said, I shrank a bit. And I think that grew, um, you know, we talk about that self-confidence journey. Mm. When I started to go to school, I was now a student athlete at the University of Wisconsin Whitewater. Now I'm in this world, world renowned school at one of the best wheelchair basketball programs in the country. I've been recruited to come here. Mm. Um, you know, the, this, this team's in the newspaper. They're win, you know, we're winning national championships. Now it's like, uh, you know, people started to notice like who I am and what I can accomplish. Um, and then I started, you know, I started to get a little cocky about that. <laughs> so my, my self-confidence kind of went through the roof. You know, there's like, you know, college, college girls know who I am, you know, like, you know, my friends are, they, they're shouting out my, you know, accolades and it, it was just amazing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> college, college, college changed things. All right. I want to get to college. So I, uh, I want to hear about Whitewater, but uh, if you were talking to, you know, parents uh, of a kid born with spina bifida, tomorrow what do you tell them if i was talking to uh, yeah and i and i do i do talk to parents all the time that are raising kids that either have spina bifida or spinal cord injuries i just tell them to encourage them to encourage them to do the things that they want to do yeah. um because not every kid is not every kid sees a basketball and lights up and just and loves and, and just loves the game or, you know, sees sports even. Maybe he, maybe he's a writer, maybe he's a singer or yep. she, or maybe, um, you know, maybe they want to be an actor. I, I say that I would tell the, I would tell the kid that, or I would tell the parents that have a kid with a disability um, to encourage them to have passions and pursue those passions, like relentlessly. Mm. Like not just kind of do it and put, you know, half your ass into it. Like see what they're passionate about yeah. and push them to relentlessly go after those passions. I mean, I, I think that's beautiful advice because what I always think about, you know, and I, you know, I have my own example in my house and I see all these athletes is, you know, you define yourself as an athlete, not as a guy with a disability, right? Athlete is first and it's your love. It's your passion. You can't, you couldn't even imagine life without sport. And so I, I'm with you on that. It doesn't have to be sport. It doesn't. Have, it could be anything. But shouldn't we all have the opportunity to define ourselves by our loves and our passions, and not what might be perceived by society as our weakness or our challenge or our struggle, right? Because non-disabled people don't wear a a tag on their sleeve that identifies what their life challenge is, right? right. But you do, That's right? You. You don't have that choice, right? That's you're 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 right about that. That's 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 golden. You know, not not everybody knows what the next person's struggle is, but they can already perceive mine when they see me. Yeah, you're a million miles away, right? Absolutely. Um, and you you got the race thing too, right? I mean, that's right. a whole nother thing that you right you have to work through. Um, and let's just stay on that just for a touch. It, you know, how has it been growing up in Detroit and then being all over the world as a black man? It's a uh, it's it's interesting because I'm a part of two demographics that are intentionally um, ignored or intentionally um, just you know I, I guess I guess we 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 like to call them we have like these these words for them like. Um, Let's, let's let's think of one of the buzzwords. It's like uh, under, under, right? under underrepresented or yeah, yeah, yeah. it's just like, let's, you know, let, if we call it what it is, it's intentionally ignored or intentional. You know, it, it's that, that's just the way it is. Um, that's that's sometimes a, a tough pill to swallow because that's, um, you know, that's that's a self-identifier. That's something that um, that's that's who I am. You know, you know, I'm always I'm always going to be a black man in a wheelchair. Um, wherever I go, and I always have to take that with me. Uh, the thing is, is that I'm very proud. I'm very proud to, to to have my disability. I'm very proud to be a black man um, because I get an opportunity to to those 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 tables that you're ignored at those those 
um, you know, those opportunities that that weren't there before, I get a chance to to create those opportunities for people that come after me. So because I, I don't think that there was a lot of um, a lot of kids that had hope to um, to to be, you know, for example, you know, in a, in a Nike commercial or even on on TV at all as represented as an athlete, um, you know, before there were athletes like myself and, and athletes that, you know, that have came after me. Um, provided that opportunity or provide that representation. Yeah. Um, I, I, I have this unique opportunity to represent this marginalized mm-hmm. group, these two marginalized groups. And I get a chance to not only represent them, but represent them well and create opportunities for the people come after. Them. So yeah. I don't see it as, um, I don't see it as like, uh, I don't know, uh, disadvantage. I see it as a, uh, I don't know, something that I wear like a badge of honor mm. and I get a chance every day to, uh, to put that badge on and, and, and go out and represent the best that I can. Yeah. I'm not even going to, I'm not even going to go down this path because I know you're going to have so many examples of discrimination based on being in a chair. Um, but have you also felt discrimination because of the color of your skin? I mean, I, it'd be impossible to say no. Um, not, I won't, I won't say that there's discrimination or, or, or situations that has, has broken me uh, or that has put me in a situation to where like, I'm like, oh no, I'm, you know, I'm being discriminated against or, oh, a door closed because, you know, I'm in a wheelchair or no, like, I've just never really been like that. You know, when doors close in my face, um, I go find another one. Um, Mm -hmm. when there's, you know, when there's, when a bridge is, is, is not available to me because, you know, because I'm an African-American or because I'm, you know, because of my disability, um, then I try to create another way or I try, you know, I, I just, or, you know, just stay stubborn and, and, and try, try my best to continue to knock that door down. Um, I'm just not, a, I'm just not one of those people that, have, you know, that it uses, you know, discrimination or, or, or anything like that as, as an excuse not to excel. Um, Mm -hmm. I've been, I've been shattering glass ceilings my entire life. I've been, um, I've been creating ways, um, for, for, for people like me and creating ways for myself, um, that didn't exist my entire life. Um, and I'm going to continue to do that. And I'm going to continue to fight for people that, that look like me. I'm going to continue to fight for people that have had the same experiences as me. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, equality is the goal. Well, you know, something I, my, I'm going to guess that you and I have a, a real a shared passion around is the lower income community and getting them into adaptive sports, because I feel like, you know, from my vantage point, they're not coming out in the numbers that they should be. Uh, and I think there's a lot there and there's probably a lot we could learn from your, you know, your experience sort of punching through that socioeconomic right ladder and, and getting where you are. Uh, not an easy problem to solve. And I think it's going to take a lot of, a lot of energy, right? A lot of our collective uh, energies to tackle that. Uh, so let's shift into college just real quick. Cause uh, I saw you light up when you started to talk about that. So you get recruited to play wheelchair basketball at Whitewater, a renowned program, maybe one of, you know, probably in the top, you know, handful of programs in the country. On probably any- in the top. That's the best program there is, my friend. <laughs> UWYY, probably the top. <laughs> UWYY is the best program in the country. Uh, uh, so, you know, you talked a little bit about it, flipping your, right, your confidence and the collegiate experience in general. Give us a sense of what that, what, what that was like. Uh, man, I mean, it was, uh, it was transformative. It was transformative. Um, I got in, in so many different ways. You know, I was meeting guys that um, that now are they're these there's the there's these like international uh, Paralympic uh, aspiring athletes that are now taking their responsibilities as as students, responsibility, responsibilities as athletes. Mm. And just shifting it way past anything that I've ever seen, like the amount of commitment. And Mm. because I'm always, I mean, I've always loved basketball. I just would go and play. And like, I just did it because I loved it. And these guys were like, they, they turned it up a notch. They showed me like, okay, like, cool. Yeah. You love to go shoot around and you love to dribble and you love to do all this, but like 
have you repeated this drill over and over to the point where you don't necessarily love it to where it's like painful? Like, you, you know, do you, do you know what it's like to, um, you know, train to, to like, it's, it's maybe not even enjoyable anymore. Like, you, you know what it means to, to work harder than the next guy? Like, okay, great. You love wheelchair basketball. Awesome. You have fun playing wheelchair basketball, but are you willing to work harder than the next guy? So, that that's that's one thing that I learned in in that came that boosted my confidence as well because now I didn't just have this you know talent that I that I that I brought to the to the game. I didn't just have like this raw ability to play the game. I now was working as hard as I possibly could and that made me feel really good. That made me you know push around as if like man I'm like the big man on campus. I'm like lifting now I'm like you know, like, like I just, I just felt, I felt amazing I, in, 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 you know, that structure in college really changed that. And that's most, is it the coach and the program or was it really the influence of your fellow players? I had an awesome coach. I had an awesome coach in, 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 uh, in a guy by the name of Tracy Chenoweth. He was, um, <laughs> he kept us in line, man. We were, a, <laughs> we were a crazy bunch of kids, man. I mean, we were from all walks of life. Um, you know, one of my best friends, Jaime Mazi, you know, he's a kid from Boston. I was coming from Detroit, so we were city boys. Um, what my, my roommate in college, his name was Jeremy Campbell. He was from, like, the sticks in Alabama. Uh, and then uh, another one, a uh, really, really, um, uh, I guess, uh, influential person in college for me was a guy by the name of Jake Counts. He was from uh, Covington, uh, Covington, Kentucky. Like, people from all over the place, right? Um, but those guys really, um, those guys really influenced me because they had, they, they came from different backgrounds. They came from different, you know, walks of life. But one thing that brought us together was like this brotherhood, like this Warhawk brotherhood that, you know, you, mm. you form, you know, you really are proud of, of the creed that you, um, that you represent when you come to this college, but also the, their love and their drive for the game was like, equal or you know greater than mine and so I needed to figure out mm. you know some of these things and and also it was really inspiring to me because like I didn't particularly like school when I went to school mm. but like some of these some of my some of my teammates were like 4.0 students and maybe they weren't the best athlete but they would come in and they would work their asses off uh, you know and they like they weren't they didn't have the trajectory of, of that, I, that I had. They were never going to be a Paralympian, but they would come and they would work twice as hard as anyone else. Mm. And they might not even get on the court. And that, like that, I learned how to work hard. I learned what dedication was, no matter what it was, to your craft as a basketball player or to your uh, responsibilities as an athlete. But I just learned this like holistic approach to being like this responsible student athlete. Um, and like I said, I mean, it was just transformative. It, it changed. It changed who I was as a person. Uh, that's such an amazing endorsement of collegiate adaptive sports. You know, it really is. I mean, it 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 took you as this unpolished gem, highly talented, lots of raw ability, and turned you into a hard worker. And that's what you needed, right? I mean, what, do you make the Paralympic team? Your first team, you were 20, right? Um, I was 18 when I made the first Paralympic Oh, you're 18. Team. Sorry. Yeah. Um, do you even make that team without starting to get your head around that work ethic? Damn right I do. <laughs> so so my, my, my thing about it is, so I, I definitely needed to... I needed to go there and learn how to play the game the right way. And I needed to learn that, that consistency and that level of hard work and what hard work actually was. But, um, I, so I, I didn't make my first team before I, I got to whitewater. Um, and I'm not, you know, I can't say what would have happened if I didn't go to whitewater, but I, I think, I think my trajectory was, was, was going up. I was, I don't know if I, I don't think I would be the same player that I am right now had not yes. gone to white water. Um, I definitely learned even just same person, you know, I just, I, like I said, I learned how to play the game the right way and just really learn how to approach sport from a, from a responsible level. 
Um, but I, I was I was well on my way to that to those to those to those Athens games, man. They, nobody was keeping me from out of the USA journey. Like that was my that was my goal, man. Like I I was so happy when I made that first national team um, because that that's what I all I wanted to do was wear the red, white, and blue. Mm, that's great. So talk to me. So you've been to a lot of international, right? Big competitions. Uh, you've You've been to five Paralympic games, brought home three medals. What, I mean, what's, what's the highlight experience uh, within your wheelchair basketball career? What's the experience that you just would not trade? So it's, that's, that's a, that's a tough one for me to say, not, not something that I can't conjure up. It's just something tough to say because I think, I think a lot of people would easily be like, oh yeah, the first gold medal was probably the best thing that you ever accomplished. Right. Right. Excuse me. And if not that one, then the second one by far. Yeah. But I think just even being being in this, being in the position that I'm in right now, and you know, having this conversation with you um after, you know, after winning that, you know, that second gold medal and, and being where I'm at right now. After the after the 2018 that I had um, is nothing short of just just amazing, and it's just a, a big uh, just a testament to um, what dedication, what commitment, and what just not accepting uh, circumstances will will give you. Because mm. um, in 2018, when I was laying in the hospital room, not knowing if I was ever going to play basketball again, and, um, recovering from that septic shock that that pretty much nearly took my life. Um, I didn't think that I was going to have, you know, a Paralympic trajectory and being able to be on that world stage again. I thought I saw the biggest accomplishments that I had ever would accomplish and not going to accomplish much more after that. Mm. I thought that my athletic career was done. So I think the best thing that I've ever accomplished um, was getting myself back to that Paralympic stage and, uh, you know, no matter how, the, how these Paralympics went, obviously a pandemic tried to jump in the way and a lot of, um, <laughs> a lot of, a lot of different things that we've had to, uh, overcome in the last, you know, 18 to 20 months. Um, I don't really even care how that all played out. Like the fact that I was able to get there, get, you know, be, be, you know, with my teammates, um, and, and, and go out there and, and kick the world's ass and take a gold medal home, um, it just it just says a lot about who I am as a as a character, who I was, who I am as an athlete, um, and I think that those this last eighteen to twenty months, or you know, maybe even before that, from twenty eighteen to now, um, will always define me as as one of the most resilient athletes to to ever be an athlete. I I love that. So you're it's really the it's really the the comeback right? It's the Phoenix rising from the ashes of a really scary medical situation. And, um, I know you've shared a bit about what happened on social. You've shared a bit with me just one-on-one, but can you walk us through what happened? And I, I think it's important for people to understand too, you know, the medical journey of living with spina bifida or a spinal cord injury, or right. A lot of these disabilities is hard. It's different. And, you know, I don't know if the word is there's more vulnerability, but man, there's, there's just more medical stuff, uh, in, in our lives as a, you know, me as a parent and obviously you, you, uh, as, as a, you know, a man with spine bifida. So can you walk us through what happened there and, and why, cause I, I feel it. I mean, when you were just telling the story, like, I love, I love the comeback. I love it. I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud of the team. Right. Uh, who doesn't love a comeback story, right? Right. I mean, come on. It's beautiful. Um, I, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's crazy because I didn't, um, <laughs> I didn't think that I was, uh, I was capable of, of, of hitting that level of rock bottom. I didn't understand. I, I thought I was like invincible, you know, mm-hmm. I was just like, so when I, I discovered that I had these pressure sores, um, I was just like, yeah okay like i'll just like patch them up for a little bit i was i was living in i was living abroad at the time um and that's that's the way that i made 
I made my income. You know, that's the way I supported myself. Right. Um, you know, professional wheelchair basketball is what I what I did. Um, and not only does, you know, that, you know, pay my way that, you know, that also helps, you know, my family back at home. Um, it, I just just there there was there's nobody like if I didn't that in my that this is my mindset is like if I don't play, you know, because of these uh, this this injury, then, you know, who's going to who's going to take care of me? You know what I mean? Like I have these sponsors that I have to uphold. Um, I have this name, like I have this, um, you know, I'm, I'm this Mr. No excuses, you know, like I built this, you know, I built up this legend of, of, a, of a basketball player, this legend of a, of an athlete. So what now, because I have like an ouchie on my boo-boo, like I can't play basketball. Like now nah, I'm right. I'm going to like, so I just have this ego thing. Yeah. Like I'm going to go on. I'll patch it up, and then you know when I get some off time, I'll uh, I'll get it take care of, care of medically, and um, you know s- tournaments get more more important, or you know there's always there's always a reason to push this stuff away. There's always a reason, like ah, you know, okay, uh, oh, well that that's going okay. You know, I'm doctoring it up. It's all right. I'm taking care of it myself, and all the while I'm just collecting this like sepsis you know like nasty you know like bacteria that that, that is um killing me. <laughs> you know that, that there's no other way to put it uh, i'm just collecting this bacteria that is killing me because i have open wounds that i'm not medically tending to in the in a responsible way um so anybody that's listening to this that needs to that feels the need to be a tough guy about any um anything that they they might be going through medically um that's not the way. That's not the way to go um, because you don't have to hit rock bottom um, to to reach the top. You can just oh, excuse me. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, you don't have to. You don't have to hit rock bottom to reach the top. Let me plug this in. Sorry about that. Oh, so the what was um, what was what was happening to me is like I said, I was collecting this this sepsis. I got very very sick. Um, and with that, with that sepsis, uh, I went into a septic shock. Um, both of my lungs failed and one of my kidneys had multi-organ failure and pretty much, uh, almost ne- nearly lost my life. I was in the hospital for four months after that recovery, um, surgery after surgery, finally, you know, you know, closed these things up, got the infection out. Thankfully didn't lose my legs or my life or anything else along the way. Um, and it was extensive, extensive um, recovery. Um, and you're in Germany the whole time, right? Yeah, I was in Germany the whole time. Just uh, which was which was a whole other. Uh, so you're you know, in like uh, you're by yourself in this hospital now, right? Es- es- essentially, you know, I won't, I won't say I was by myself. You know, so luckily I was a part of I was part of a great program, um, and it was like you know when you're a part of a team, you know, you say your family. And those those guys really treated me well. You know, shout out to Jake Williams, who's a, who's a really good friend of mine. Um, he was playing. He was playing. Uh, he's also a national team member of mine. But he was playing on that national team with me, or that German team with me. And he would come spend hours with me and just kind of like he's he's not really like your like heartfelt kind of guy. Uh, you know, uh, he he never he never like come and like be like, hey man, how you doing? Is everything going all right? He would like come. And, like talk a bunch of trash to me, tell me that, you know, because I'm in Germany, they are going to do experiments on me. And uh, he, he would, he would just, but that was quality time that I needed. Um, I also had a teammate by the name of Yitzka Visser who would come and, I mean, the hospital food was so bad, man. I, <laughs> that was so horrible. She would like bring me sushi dinners and sit with me at the, you know, like, so I, and obviously my, you know, friends and family from, from back home, I would, I would have to connect with virtually. Yeah which we've all become really accustomed to. I, I was, I was ahead of the game. Man. You were, everybody you were started, down with it in oh, 2018. Bro, when, when everybody started doing this, like all this, like work from home and all this, this become virtual. I, I became a master at this because I was already doing it. I was already quarantined. Oh man. That's yeah. What, what, was there a moment in the hospital where it hit you that you could die? Like you're, it, the, the doctors say something or could you just tell from their energy? Like what, what was that? So uh, yeah, I've, I've, I've told this story before, 
Um, and I'm going to tell it again is, is one of the scariest things is when I, you know, I woke up from the, you know, I, I didn't mention I was in a seven day coma. Um, so when I woke up from this coma, um, after, after collapsing, um, you know, my, the scariest thing I did was try to reach and grab a glass of water because I, I couldn't, I couldn't hold it up. It just, you know, I couldn't hold up a glass of water. Um, so did I think I was going to die? I don't know if I ever thought I was going to die. Mm. I, I mean, it was, it looked pretty scary. Like where I was at was like, man, this is, this is horrible. But I definitely didn't think I was going to be able to function as a, not just an athlete, but just as like a person anymore. I was just like, what's happened to me? Like I've lost my ability to do everything. And I didn't think I was going to get it back. I know. And you're such a beautiful, strong human being. So to you, for you to not be able to hold up a glass of water, seems so, I can't even, I can't even fathom it, but at some level you were like, not everybody comes out of comas. So that doesn't sound like a great little run, the seven day coma thing. No, it was not. I think, I think it was more scary for the people around me. Like there was, when I woke up and I, I finally like started connecting to the outside world. And I, I remember, Oh man, I remember, <laughs> I remember logging on to social media and that was this, to be honest, that, that blew me away because people were like basically right in my obituary, like basically like here lies Matt. He was such a great player. And he's so, you know, like, oh, uh, like it was, what? no, there was like all these like tributes basically like, cause you were in a coma. Yeah. And like, people just thought it was like done. it was scary. It was, I felt like I read my own, like, like it felt like I actually died. It was, it was scary, man. Like just looking at people's like little tributes things and people reaching out to me that like, that I, they probably don't even, like people that I've competed with that don't even really like me, you know, like they're in my inbox, like telling me like, Hey man, you know, you were such a, I'm like, Whoa, like I was such a, like but looking back, the, that was, that blows me away. Like That's some of the, so trippy. So people are using past tense with you and those messages came in while you were in a coma so everyone just thought you were dying that's exactly because they were you never on. really you never really thought you were dying but everyone around you thought you were dying there you go that's exactly <laughs> what it was um, but there were you know there were definitely moments within that within that seven days that they told um they told everyone around me that i'd be i'd be lucky to uh to to come out of this wow Man. <sighs> yeah. Scary stuff, man. That's for sure. I mean, it gives you a lot of perspective, right? And and helps you probably s- filter through your uh, your friend list too to see who's really got your back on that one. <laughs> they they say they say your friend, your friends don't really come around until the lights go off, right? You know, that's what you know, that's how you know who your friend who your friends are. <laughs> That's um oh, yeah, that's for sure. Changes your perspective. Gosh. Oh man. That's wild. That's wild. Uh, and then so talk to me just a little bit about the rehab process. I know it was brutal and you almost had to start from nothing, right? I mean, you were you were uh emaciated, lost a lot of muscle mass, I'm assuming. I mean and man, I mean, I was I was bedridden like for four months straight. Like I couldn't even, I couldn't even get in my day chair. Like I was right bedridden in trapped in a room, like completely isolated. Uh for for four months. That was that was crazy. I basically had to start from scratch. Um I was very um <laughs> I, I prided myself on, you know, how well I take care of my body, what I, what I eat, but, you know, I was like building this specimen of a person um, off to just kind of, you know, just basically start from scratch. It was, it was crazy. Um, it was scary. It was, it was, it made me angry. It made me sad. It made me grateful. It made me happy. It made me, I, every emotion that you could possibly go through, I went through in those four months. Um, there were times where I was super motivated. There were times that I felt hopeless. There was times where, um, you know, that I thought, you know, everybody had my back. There were times that I thought nobody had my back. There's times that I, I, I really like, I'm like, I'm going to, I'm going to do this. You know, I'm going to sit, you know, I, I wrote down, I remember writing down, like, I'm going to win a gold medal in the 2020 Paralympics. I wrote, I wrote that down. 
I still I still have that in my notebook. Wow. Um, and I remember also because <laughs> I wrote it down several times. I remember also falling that same piece of paper up and and just not believing it at all. You know, I remember when I. I remember when I first started to doubt myself in the recovery process. I those those were those are the times that I think made me feel the strongest afterwards. Like those are the times that made me feel strong when I had to look at those days and come come to terms with myself and like come like start to realize like hey you can do this. Like what are you what are you thinking? Like mm-hmm. you know this this is the step from A to B. Like it wasn't writing this thing down and it was going to just come to fruition. It was like this personal roadmap that I had to follow in order to make these things happen. Um, and when I started to, to map those things down, um, you know, they say writing your goals down is like a roadmap for the conscious mind. Mm-hmm. I was very conscious of my, of my awareness uh, or my, I'm sorry, my, of my situation. Um, so I was, I would just map this out. I would just be like, okay, this is where I'm at right now. How do I get to where I want to go? So mm-hmm. that, you know, even, even right now that that's what I did, you know, mm-hmm. those person, those personal roadmaps is how I check in with myself. And in the recovery process, I, it sounds like lots of ups and downs, like probably every recovery process. Uh, is there a moment where you're questioning whether you can make the team again? And, and does is there a point where you have to be, is there sort of a tryout? I know you're already on the team, but like, did you have to sort of demonstrate that you were capable to sort of then rejoin the team and how, you know, was that a, a point of like, you know, self so, self questioning? So the, it was crazy. Cause I, all right. So I got out of the hospital, uh, March of 2019. Mm-hmm. Um, March of 2019. Um, there's this, there's this, there's this um, major competition in, in Europe. It's called Champions Cup. Um, not many people win them. Um, it's an incredibly difficult tournament to win, um, but it's the best of the best in Europe. In you know, you, you play the best of the best. It, it doesn't matter if you're in Germany. It doesn't matter if you're in France. Uh, Ger- you know, Germany, France, Spain. It doesn't matter where you're at. But you go to this tournament um, that you have to qualify for. And you play the best of the best. And whoever comes out alive is the champion of Europe. Um, So that tournament is in May. I got out in March. And uh, I remember my coach, uh, Michelle Engel, he's uh, he's uh, he's still he's still coaching that team, uh, the Turin Bulls right now. And he would come and, you know, he he definitely did not think I was going to play anymore that year, um, which was even better that he like come and hang out with me and talk NBA. Um, you know, he would, he, th- that team was great, but anyway, so, um, he would, uh, he would come and, you know, he would talk to me about, you know, different, you know, different things that we could do next year, you know, and yeah, you know, he would try to keep my, my spirits high. And I would tell him like, Hey, like it, when, when I get out of here, I want to play, you know, I want to mm-hmm. play in the tournament. And he's just like, yeah, I don't really know if that's going to happen. He tried to, he tried to manage my expectations. Um, and I remember like, like preparing, I'm using their quotes. Like I remember like having them bring me a basketball and I would do like little ball drills and things like that just to get, you know, better, better feeling for the ball. I would like shoot baskets into like my clothes hamper. Like that was, that was like my, like, all right, you know, that was my Rocky in the meat freezer moments. Like you could, you could just hear like, <laughs> you just hear the Rocky theme song playing as I'm, I'm shooting baskets into a trash can. Oh my gosh. Um, so I remember when uh, he told me that I wasn't going to be able to play in that tournament and I got out, I got out in March. Uh, I was sneaking into my balls here cause I wasn't supposed to sit into it yet. Um, and I was, I was feeling good. I felt like, I mean, I was tired early, mm. tired early, but I was feeling good. And I was like, tell him like, Hey, listen, can I, um, can I, can I practice? Can I practice with the team? He's like, yeah, okay. Like, let's go to the doctor and see if they clear you. They clear me for practice. I was, you know, I was playing super well. And, you know, he started putting me back with the starters. The starters are looking super good. You know, he's just like, all right, I kept having to get medical clearance. I was progressing really, really fast. You wow. know, I have, a, I have a, I have a, you know, I have a know-how to play the game. 
so those those get I finally long story short, I ended up playing in that tournament and we won it. Um, we won that Champions Cup. Um, but that prepared me for the tryout that was gonna happen in 2019. Um so right. I had I had for a few US team. Yeah, for the US team. I had a few prerequisites. So I was able to play in Europe before I came back and play with the national team. And and I was able to to prove myself to make that qualifier for, for Tokyo. Wow. Okay. Um, give me a, a, a glimpse into Tokyo. Glimpse into Tokyo. It was, uh, it was crazy, man. It was like, uh, how can I, how can I say, I just feel like there was so much that went into it. Um, that, that particular team, um, is one of the cl- most close knit teams that you'll ever, ever see. Like those are my brothers and they always will be. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so the glimpse into Tokyo is that uh, we went there. We, 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 we definitely played well enough to bring home a gold. I don't know if we, I don't know if we went over there and just dominated the competition, you know, no, but that that's not, that's not exciting. You know, like we played it, we played some, you know, we played some hard games, you know, like that gold medal game was hard fought. A lot of people thought that, um, that Japan was going to be able to take it from us. Um, we showed a lot of resilience. We showed a lot of fight and we showed that our brotherhood is stronger than any pandemic that, uh, that, that could have been put in front of us. And uh, it was cool. We got a chance to, to, to compete at the highest level and take home the shiniest prize. Well, you know, one of my, one of the, one of those, I don't know, one of my favorite moments from the, from the games was sitting in the lobby with your whole team watching the women's wheelchair basketball team play. And, you know, I don't know the whole team, but I know Courtney pretty well. And I know Darlene and, you know, some of the girls. And so it was so fun to watch it with your whole squad. Cause I mean, you guys were just, I mean, it, you guys were funny. I mean, just I mean, making fun of each other and like yelling at the, yelling at the ladies to, you know, step it up and here and then. So it was just, it was so fun to, to be, you know, I mean, I, you know, you, your guys probably barely noticed that I was sitting there, but it was a really fun experience for me uh, to just see that. I, I could see what you're saying. You know, the team felt, they all, you all felt like brothers to me. Well, always will be, always will be. I mean, even, even to this day, I just talked to a couple of the guys, you know, a few minutes ago uh, mm-hmm. before we hopped on this call. Um, those, those are my brothers, man. And, and it's not because we want to go medal together. It's because we've always had each other's back and we always will. Yeah. Yeah, that's really beautiful. Uh, before I dive into the last big section, which is the soul searching, I want to I want to understand uh, where you are in life today. Have you sort of retired from basketball? I know you've got a you know job at Visa now, so you're a corporate guy. Like, <laughs> what's going on? So, I mean, I think that's that's one of the like burning questions that that people would be asking me about, like this retirement. Like, what? <laughs> What is what is this retirement thing? Like I I live wheelchair basketball. Like I I I don't play wheelchair basketball. Like I am wheelchair basketball. Like so <laughs> re- re- retirement, retirement will be like like I, I'm married to this game. It's like till death do us part. Like there's no there's no there's no retirement. Like, All right. I, so how many how many more Paralympic games do you want to play in? Oh, who knows about that? You know, as far as like as far as even even you know. Uh, you know, get, get, as far as as far as trying out for the for the next national team, as far as like the next Paralympics go, um, who knows? That's like, like I said, that's the burning question. But playing wheelchair basketball is not something that I do. I live wheelchair basketball. I wake yeah. up every day and I like I I you know I dream about it. I I go out. You know I I I, I work. I work as hard as I possibly can, no matter what, like I'm, I'm out here, bro. I'm, I'm still working as hard as I possibly can. Um, am I going to be on the national team on the next national team? I can't answer that question for you. Yeah. Um, am I going to go to the next Paralympics? Hmm, I don't know, but I, I can tell you that this, that last, that last game that we just, that we just played in Tokyo being yeah. a gold medal winning game. And then going off into the into the sunset with the with the um, with the flag bearer and with the with the with the American flag in my hand. That's pretty cinematic. That's pretty. It's pretty picturesque. Um, but I, I live wheelchair basketball. I never retire from it. That that would mean that I'm no longer here. <laughs> All right. 
Well answered, my friend. Uh, well answered. All right. Soul searching. This is rapid fire. Uh, a fun or interesting fact that I don't know about you. I speak Turkish. That's super cool. Tell me something. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, what do you want? City <laughs> Seviyorum, <laughs> which means I love you. That's good. From playing ball in Turkey? Yeah, I lived there for six years. Okay. Very cool. Uh, what has your disability taught you? My disability has taught me that uh, my disability has taught me that no matter there's not one way to do things, you can always adapt and you can always overcome. Okay, good. What what have you learned from your mistakes or failures? My failures have been my my biggest teachers. Um, the things that I've things that I've learned from my failures is that they don't make me. Um, mm. The things uh, either, but either do my 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 achievements. Um, it's about it's about what you do afterwards. Mm -hmm. That's good advice for all the Paralympians and Olympians that are dealing with post Tokyo uh, <laughs> stress syndrome. Right. Uh, Speaking of stress, what stresses you out? What stresses me out? Ooh, uh, uncertainty. Mm -hmm. That's good. Me too. Uh, what would you say is your life philosophy or sort of quotes or sayings that you live by? I, 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 think, I think it would be like criminal if I didn't say like no excuses. I think people would probably hold me against that. Hold me, hold me accountable for that. So <laughs> no excuses for sure. Um, I like a personal, a post, a personal, I guess, mantra of mine is just to, yeah, I just, I just want to, I, you know, I just, I just, I just want to, you know, chase positive outcomes and, and stay as optimistic as I possibly can. Um, keep smiling, keep smiling is my personal mantra. That's good. Uh, who is your most important mentor in your life? Most important mentor in my life, easily, easily my mom. Mm. Um, you know, she's she's taught me that um, you know, no matter what hand you're dealt, you got you gotta keep a you gotta keep a poker face and just um just make the best of of what's put in front of you. Mm. Um I, I yeah, my mom has taught me so much resilience so much you know mental fortitude um and just you know staying positive it's good still got to meet your mom uh what do you want to accomplish in this next phase of your life say go out 10 years what are you what are you going after right now so right now i am you know, I was, I was, I was on the, uh, I was on the Paralympic stage in Tokyo. I was on the Paralympic stage in, in you know, four other Paralympic uh, stages. Uh, right now, I'm in a different arena in the corporate setting, as you said, um, and I'm fighting different fights. Um, mm -hmm. I'm, you know, I'm fighting for, uh, for sports equality. Mm -hmm. um, I'm fighting for, um, for Paralympic representation. I'm fighting for African American. Um, representation i'm fighting for uh for for people to have um, opportunities when they're done mm -hmm. i don't want people to i don't want people to be over in europe playing basketball like oh shit what do i do next mm -hmm. i want to create those opportunities for them so right now i'm creating paths that, that that people don't even see right now i'm knocking down doors for them so they don't have to well that's fantastic and you know that's a beautiful way to kind of wrap this thing up uh before we sign off i uh i hand the microphone to all my guests and hey is there something we haven't talked about is there something you wanted to say you didn't say it someone you wanted to acknowledge that you didn't mention uh the microphone's yours Ooh, the microphone's mine all right well <laughs> I will, as someone who has just came back um, from, from, you know, an illustrious career playing over in Europe. Um, that was it. That was an amazing experience, um, to be a world traveler, to, to, um, you know, collect some accolades and, and sort of treat, you know, that, that region of the world, like, 
like my own personal gift shop. But I will say that that opportunity um, is a necessity for elite wheelchair basketball players. And I wish that it wasn't. Um, I wish that it, that we didn't have to go there to create a living for ourselves and to make make sports our number one priority. I wish that we didn't have to. I wish that it was an op- it was an option to stay here in the states and be an elite athlete that can support themselves, that can that can do it at a professional level, um, and still and still be here in the states. And, and you know, I I think that it's uh, it's a detriment to our to our national program that we have to go overseas and we have to lend our talents and 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 expose our our national guys to the other teams and it, may, it makes it makes the it makes the rest of the world just as good as we are you know if not better sometimes mm-hmm. uh, I think it I think it takes um I think it takes away um, from our our elite our domination. Um, Mm -hmm. I wish that there was professional opportunities for not only wheelchair basketball, but for adaptive sports widespread. Mic drop. Wow. All right. We need to talk about that one offline. Um, Where, uh, and I agree with everything you just said, by the way, Uh, where can our audience find you on social media or the web? What's your handle? My handle is Matt Scott Fly at Instagram.com. Um, that's pretty much the only platform that I live at right now. Um, okay. I'm pretty inactive on Facebook, but you can find me, Matt Scott. Um, and I'm Matt Scott Fly on Twitter as well, but you're not going to catch me tweeting too much. <laughs> <laughs> Mostly the gram. That's right. All right. Well, listen, uh, Matt, thank you uh, from the bottom of my heart for your time this evening. Uh, I am eternally grateful for you as a human being rolling around this planet and uh, the the positivity and the love that you share with everyone you interact with. I know our listeners and our audience is, is going to really enjoy your, your story today. And uh, just thanks for being supportive of uh, our little sweet nonprofit Angel City Sports. And uh, we've got a lot, we a lot to do, a lot to conquer going forward. And I think doing it together, uh, it's all possible. So just thank you again for joining us tonight. And uh, man, I can't wait to see what you, uh, you you accomplish over this next phase in your life. I'm humbled, I'm honored, and I appreciate you, Clayton.